All right, howdy friends, and welcome to Yellowstone National Park. So beautiful. All right, you're asking, what's the catch? This doesn't look like Yellowstone. Well, it is and it isn't. It's obviously not the current location of Yellowstone National Park as you know, know it. Uh, there's obviously no bison roaming around here, no moose, no elk. We have no hydrothermal features. We have no uh, lodgepole pine forests. But what we do have is a really impressive record of Yellowstone being in this area. So I am actually at what used to be Yellowstone. So we could call this Old Yellowstone or Ancient Yellowstone. And this is an area about uh, 40 minutes south of the town of Twin Falls, where I live, right near the Nevada border. This is Salmon Falls Reservoir. Um, this is a, a creek that's dammed up that flows north into the Snake River and the Snake River Plain. The big bench we have over here is Brown's Bench, and we'll talk a little bit about those rocks here uh, in a second. But we are right here where the Yellowstone hotspot resided about 8 to 10 million years ago. So we're looking at rocks and deposits and a rich geologic history that is tied directly to the Yellowstone hotspot. Um, and it is neat because the similar, some of the features I'm seeing here are very similar to what I saw at Yellowstone a few weeks ago. And so you might even go back to uh, some of the videos I did there, particularly the big hike I did up to the Huckleberry Ridge Tough. We'll see a lot of similarities here. And so that might um, help convince you or just provide that connection between those two locations. Um, and so we are here in the Rogerson Graben. We're in a low area. We're down by the reservoir, so it's a little hard to see, but we've got uh, Brown's Bench up here which is made out of, you can see the layers up there, we're looking to the west, just stacks and stacks of rhyolite. And we'll talk more about the rhyolite here in a second. Uh, if we could see behind me here to the east, you would see another uplifted area called the Casia Mountains, or sometimes locally it's called the South Hills, which is made of very similar rocks. But this reservoir and this uh, canyon and creek is actually occupying this low area here in uh, the Rogerson Graben. So let's start with a diagram here that will help us understand a little bit, I believe, what's going on here. So let's look at just how do these Yellowstone style eruptions kind of work. And this is probably a little bit of review for some of you, but just to make sure we're all on the same page. So Yellowstone Snake River Plain style eruptions. And so we have uh, our magma source down here. It's a rhyolitic magma. It's rich in silica. It's sticky. It's pasty. Uh, we believe it's high temperature, and we'll talk about that here in a minute as we look at some of the rocks. And the point is we get very explosive eruptions initially. So as this rhyolitic magma erupts, typically out of uh, vents, possibly on the sides. I drew two vents here. It doesn't have to be two. Um, we get these big, towering, colossal um, columns of ash that go up into the atmosphere and sometimes even to the, into the stratosphere. So this is what we call our eruption column. And so we blanket the ground with a little bit of ash during the initial phase of the eruption. So this is just the vent getting established, the magma uh, breaching the surface initially, exploding into ash-sized particles because it's very gas-rich and very explosive. But then if we fast forward just a little bit, this could be a few minutes later, maybe a couple hours potentially, um, and we kind of get to the eruption stage here more or less in full force. What we have here is now bigger eruptions of ash, much more energy. And as this ash gets pushed up into the atmosphere, there's so much ash up here that eventually some of it actually collapses. And this is what we call column collapse. And as the ash collapses and moves down to the ground, it actually gets uh, heated a little bit more. It's already somewhat hot, but it probably cooled somewhat as it went higher into the atmosphere. But as it collapses and that air gets compressed, that actually heats up the ash and triggers these pyroclastic flows, these avalanches of hot ash, gas, rock. This is the most terrifying thing a volcano can throw at you, moving at 100 or more miles an hour um, with temperatures as we're going to see uh, maybe as hot as 1800 degrees Fahrenheit or 1000 degrees uh, centigrade. Notice we've got the ash fall tough here because this is a layer of ash that fell during the initial phase. So the initial phase puts ash on the ground just a little bit, maybe uh, a foot or two, uh, but then we get these big pyroclastic flows barreling across the landscape. And so I think what we'll do here is start with, I do want to take you through the rocks here. Um, 
But let's start with uh, this model of what we kind of see here. We've got kind of a couple of big words I want to introduce to you here. So you can impress your friends at your next social event with these uh, with these fancy words I'm going to introduce to you here. Um, so try to try to get these pronounced right. Maybe work on the spelling. This can be your big task for the the week, I suppose. So fancy words for the day. So an ignimbrite. This might be a word you've heard before. An ignimbrite is not a rock type. It is not a specific rock type. What it is is a, a deposit of material uh, that's associated with a pyroclastic flow. So it's a collection of rocks, or maybe just one rock type. It depends. Associated with or deposited by a pyroclastic flow. Again, these big avalanches of hot ash moving at uh, high speeds across the landscape. Um, your next big word, and this one's a mouthful, is rheomorphism. So rheomorphism, I tried to make the definition as short as I could, but <laughs> it's the best I could do. So it's a process where ash and other tephra, so just fragments that are thrown out of the volcano airborne, um, are hot enough that they weld and flow as a ductile mass. So think about that for a second. We actually have evidence here, uh, both here and at Yellowstone and in other places as well. Sometimes there's eruptions that are so hot, the ash is so hot, or there's so much of the ash in terms of its thickness that the ash actually welds itself together. So it's essentially becoming a rock in a way, and not in a rock in a brittle sense, but it's be becoming kind of like toothpaste. It, and it, a better example would be, it's essentially becoming lava. So we erupt all this ash, but as it welds together and then flows under its own weight and gravity, um, it becomes what we call, that's what we call rheomorphism. Just a rheomorphism is this process where it's, it's moving and behaving like a ductal mass. Again, think of like flowing honey or syrup or a very thick, sticky lava. And so if you put the two words together, you get a rheomorphic ignimbrite. And again, if you drop this at your next social event, maybe a Christmas party, get together with the family for Thanksgiving and tell them you've been studying and analyzing rheomorphic ignimbrites, um, you're sure to turn some heads and uh, probably, you know, get some uh, some notoriety and uh, acknowledgements there amongst the family and friends. So let's look at what one of these deposits typically looks like. So a typical Snake River Plain rheomorphic ignimbrite. Remember, these are super hot. So these pyroclastic flows, this is beyond what you would see like at a Mount St. Helens eruption. These are much hotter, greater volume of ash. These are some of the big Yellowstone eruptions. And so I've drawn a little cross section here with our uh, budding and excited geologist here. So the first thing we would see at the bottom, and this is after studying these extensively, uh, geologists have kind of put this sequence together. So the first thing we'd see is a paleosol, basically a a ancient soil horizon along the bottom where the soil has been baked by the heat. So the, here's the, this is the ground surface right here pre preceding the eruption. Uh, then the next thing, remember we talked about the initial phase of the eruption is producing ash, so the ash fall tough would be the next thing that we would see. And then as this pyroclastic flow moves across the landscape, this line right here is the pyroclastic flow inundating the landscape. The bottom of the pyroclastic flow is in contact with the ground, so it's cooling very quickly. There's a big temperature change between this, you know, 1,000 degrees Celsius pyroclastic flow and the 60 degree or whatever uh, ground surface. And so it cools very quickly and forms a glassy layer. And I'll show you this in a second called a vitrophere. That could be your next big word for the day. This is a rock type. It's kind of in between obsidian and rhyolite. It's more crystallized than obsidian, uh, but it's very black and glassy. Then we have the, most of the, the ignimbrite deposit is this welded tuff, just a rhyolitic tuff, um, has a lot of internal folding in it. And I'm going to show you that. There might be vesicles or little gas bubbles that are kind of squished. It definitely has a fabric to it or a, a planar or nearly planar arrangement here. So it has a lot of layers to it. And then sometimes at the top, not all the time, but oftentimes if we have a full section, which isn't always the case, we might see a little bit more of that vitrophere, that glassy layer where the top of the pyroclastic flow has cooled in contact with the air. Uh, and so there's your uh, diagram there. So let's look at some rocks because that's much more exciting. Um, and let's kind of make some observations as we work our way uh, through this section. Then I have one more diagram for you and then we'll walk up top here. So beneath my feet you can see is this brick red layer that extends from this contact here um, 
quite a ways down and then you kind of lose it underneath some of the talus there but it's at least um i don't know maybe five meters if if not thicker than that maybe 20 feet or so um, one of the more interesting things we see here are these columns so we have these crude columns forming in the paleosol in this ancient soil horizon right below the contact with the the ignimbrite deposit with the the pyroclastic flow material um, and so if you think about what you know about these co little columnar joints which is kind of what they looks like they, they look a lot like the columnar joints we see in basalts or other volcanic rocks these are cooling features so as the heat from the pyroclastic flow has pervasively um, oxidized some of the iron and welded this this, uh, this rock here is actually quite hard as it's uh, cooled subsequently it's actually developed these little uh, fractures or joints in it somewhat like we see with lava flows so we have this red paleosol kind of fine-grained uh, mostly silts maybe a little bit of sand then we have this really sharp contact right here um, that we can actually trace out all the way down the way and it kind of drops down a little bit beyond here but you can see this really amazing contact right here with the with the paleosol and there's even a little bit of bleaching here a little little discoloration um and this is ground zero i mean this is exactly where the hot ash initially hit the ground if we step back a little bit we can see there's a change right here so we've got maybe a foot and a half or so half a meter if you will of this kind of lighter gray material before it grades up into this very black material and this is and this is much more uh, bedded right you can see a lot of layering in this whereas you get up into this black layer here um, it's more massive it doesn't have a lot of the layering so this is the ash fall tuff this is the second this is the ash that fell out of the sky initially um, when the eruption started to, to occur. So when the ash was just kind of getting out of the vent, blanketing the landscape, this is this ash fall tub. And this is the predecessor for the big bad pyroclastic flows, which come in right here. So here is our vitrophere, our lower vitrophere. And again, it's black, it's kind of glassy, but it doesn't break like obsidian. It's not as massive with the big curved surfaces. You can see in here uh, some of these little crystals as well. So it has some small crystals in it, but most of it is just really black uh, and glassy. So we've got our paleosol, our ash fall tuff, our vitrophere. And then looking above, we've got again, a nice sharp contact right here, which you can kind of see running down the way. The next above the vitrophere is a little bit more reddish layer um, and that layer kind of alternates in color a little bit, but kind of reds and grays, and that goes all the way up to the skyline. This, this one ignimbrite deposit is about 200 feet, about 60 or so meters thick at a minimum. We've got some of it eroded off the top, so we don't know how thick it was originally, um, but just a massive uh, deposit of pyroclastic material that then fused together, welded itself together, and then flowed. Um, so let me show you a quick diagram and then I want to take you up above to show you some of the really impressive features within the tuff itself. So one more diagram here. Hopefully these are helpful. My artwork, not the best, but hopefully these are helpful. So there are actually a couple different models for how these rheomorphic ignimbrites are emplaced. And they were confusing to early geologists because they really matched what you kind of see and expect from a rhyolite lava flow. So when rhyolitic lava is sticky and pasty and thick and just kind of oozes out of a volcano, it forms a lot of the, the features we see with these ignimbrite deposits. Uh, but there's a couple key things that differentiate them and it, it took a while to kind of sort it all out. But we now have at least two models, competing models, um, I think one's a little more favored than the other, but we'll see how it all shakes out. So the, the original model was you've got these pyroclastic flows moving along the ground at fast speeds. Then they start to slow down. And as they start to slow down, that's when you're starting to get some of the folding uh, on, in the interior. It's starting to set up as a, um, as a cohesive mass 
of kind of slightly melted rock or welded rock. Um, and then eventually, as it, as it stops moving, and then it kind of slides due to gravity. So this model argues that a lot of the movement and the folding you see occurred after it came to rest. So it's slowing down here, comes to rest, and then it kind of oozes downhill, somewhat like a lava flow, uh, to form a lot of the folding we see internally. Uh, another model that's competing, that's a little bit newer and um, pretty well documented, I think it explains things. Let me grab a rock here a little bit better. Whoops. Let's try that again. Just enough breeze. Um, kind of goes like this. So similar beginning to the story here with uh, ash and a pyroclastic flow. But here in this stage, we start to have material on the bottom start to glue itself together. Um, so it's already started con congealing into that um, welded material while the ash moves across it quickly across the top. So what this sets up is shear, right? We're, we're moving this material, in this case to the right, so much quicker than the material below. If we move ahead in time, we just keep adding to the material on the bottom. More and more ash is settling to the bottom, kind of getting glued to this material, which is hot and welded and is starting to deform a little bit internally. So we're starting to get some folding already in here while the rest of this ash kind of moves across the top of it. And we might see some ash behaving, you know, laminar, meaning it's just moving from point A to point B. It might be kind of moving kind of like a, in a circular pattern, what we call turbulent flow. Um, and then eventually, as it cools, we retain a lot of the internal, um, a lot of these internal folds, uh, these squished vesicles and gas bubbles. We might see rotated crystals that show us which way it all kind of moved. And so this is the other model for these um, rheomorphic ignimbrites. So a couple things to kind of just keep in mind there. So let me take you up top. So again, just the beautiful basal contact with the initiation of the eruption. And these are about, I don't know if this one's been dated, it's I think somewhere between eight to 10 million years ago. So we're gonna leave the paleosol there and the ash fall tough, which forms this very <coughs> distinct bench. We're gonna work our way up through the vitrophere, the black glassy material. Um, kind of get up this talus slope. And now already we're right where we can see this sharp contact with the red, the more internal parts of this pyroclastic flow. This is the part that cooled quickly because it was in contact with the ground a good two meters or so, maybe three, six to eight feet. <clears throat> now we have the interior of the pyroclastic flow that was again molten or it behaved like a molten material um, as it was moving and came to rest. And what we want to do is get up into these cliffs here and see if we can see some of the internal folding that took place. You can see that this rock has a strong fabric to it. It's very layered. In fact, it breaks out into big sheets. A lot of people actually come out here and um, collect some of these big flat rocks because they form like a nice flagstone. We actually came out here uh, during COVID with our family and collected a bunch of rocks for uh, under our pergola, kind of like some landscaping rocks. Um, but yeah, you can see some of these big, flat, durable sheets of rock. Very hard. Okay, um, if we go into the shade here, I think we can see one of these really nice folds. So if we look, a little tricky to see. Um, let's see. Oh, here we go, right here. There's actually a really nice fold right here. And this fold's kind of laying on its side like this, right behind my fingers. Um, and so some of you might know folds. We have anticlines, which are arched upwards. Synclines, which look like a smile arched downwards, but these folds that kind of lay on their sides are actually what we call isoclinal folds. And so you can kind of see that through here running up this way. Uh, and then there's a hinge right here, a curve, as it sort of curves back over on top of itself. And again, this is some of this internal 
deformation that occurred when this flow was moving, um, these pyroclastic flows were moving. Um, I think we've got one more spot down the way we can go look. The lighting kind of, you got to get the lighting just right. I looked at that fold about 30 minutes ago and it looked awesome. And then it was a little trickier to find once I got the camera rolling. But we can see, yeah, the layering here, um, somewhat kind of monotonous rock to the casual observer and see, kind of look at it a little bit closer. Another fold right here. We can actually see, this is actually a pretty good one. And if I can get just to the right spot, you can see, I'll take off my glasses so you can see a little better. The rock's kind of wrapping around right here, kind of making a, a C or a backward C shape right here in front of me. Again, these folds are a little bit tricky. You gotta look for them. Um, but where you see these kind of curved uh, surfaces, what we would call the hinge zone of the fold, turns out to be a nice, nice little clue. Um, so, oh, this one's gonna be good. So the one I can see in front of us is maybe the best of the lot, a little more pronounced. Um, you can see though that the, the fabric in these rocks is used as this pyroclastic flow with shearing materials are being transported, put to, put to a very strong uh, layering in these, these welded tufts, these rhyolitic welded tufts. Okay, this is gonna be good. So we can see straight in front of me here, a fold, uh, another isoclinal fold shaped this way. I wanna get a little bit closer. But then even better is, here we go. So hopefully you can see right here, this nice C shape. And then over here, you can see there's some surfaces that are curved. In fact, oh boy, these are even better. Um, we've got this curved surface coming up and then this one here wrapping around over the top of itself. So it's actually kind of presenting itself as a, uh, a it's just a very, tight series of folds but right here you can see this little arch in in the welded tuff and the rhyolite uh really spectacular and another one gosh the more i look at it the more i'm starting to see some of these folded shapes so this just imagine this thing just sort of wrapping over itself when this thing was um not ash but actually a semi molten mass of of ash um ash and um it's hard to explain, molten material, it acted like a ductile material, um, somewhat like lava. So anyway, um, hopefully that's helpful. Kind of a longer video than I normally do, but something instructive. I find these things fascinating. They're close to my house. Uh, these rheomorphic ignimbrites just conveying the power of, and the, the volume, the, the, the sheer magnitude of these Yellowstone style eruptions not just the ones in Yellowstone today, but here along the Snake River Plain in the track of the Yellowstone hotspot. And otherwise just out here at Salmon Falls Reservoir, a couple of folks out there fishing, um, but just super impressive once you kind of look at the landscape and can figure these out a little bit. Uh, appreciate any support you can send. The PayPal link's always on the,